I just want to say that it's not about egos. It's not about heroes. It's not about uh, one person. It's about people. By focusing on the work of 10 activists, this project highlights how U.S. feminism intersects with other social movements aiming to end oppression based on race, class, sexuality, and disability. This aspect of U.S. feminism has often been overlooked. Generally speaking, the first wave can be dated from the um, Seneca Falls convention in 1848 that women who were by and large connected with the anti-slavery movement decided to launch this convention at Seneca Falls. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was, a, was an integral figure um, to talk about women's rights. Women in the anti-slavery movement realized that they were really important, that the reform efforts were, were central to what was going on in terms of raising people's consciousness about what they felt, you know, the, the sort of moral wrongs of slavery and how it compromised the nation. Women's efforts were absolutely central. The women who came together at Seneca Falls came together to really sort of articulate women's rights. But the first wave of feminism, I think, is very typically dated from sort of 1848 and having sort of having grown out of the abolition. Um, impetus in this country. During the Civil War and after the Civil War, when there is an opening up of a discussion about citizenship rights in terms of slaves, you know, what's going to happen after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, what's going to happen in terms of making citizens out of, out of former slaves. 
And so the 13th Amendment abolishes um, slavery. The 15th Amendment really made it very, very clear that citizenship rights, voting rights, were going to be extended to men. Those are some of the, the highlights of the first wave. The first wave then, of course, um, pushing for women's suffrage throughout the um, latter half of the 19th century, being linked in some cases to the temperance movement um, and other reform initiatives and sort of more and more and more radical um, approaches to trying to secure the right for women to vote up into you know, the passage of the, of the 19th Amendment. The second wave of feminism would be probably linked to the publication of post-World War II texts um, in the early 60s, Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, um, even Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. And another highlight of the second wave would be the National Organization of Women um, in the late 60s, I believe it's 1967 or 1968. Um, and the sort of you know bubbling up of the feminist sentiment, again, some of which um, historians have connected to issues that came out of the civil rights movement. One problem with the wave model is that it suggests that something rises, falls away, and then is gone. And that's not the way that the feminist movement has occurred. It's occurred with different people in different places doing their work at different times. Another problem with the WAVE model is that it highlights white women's activism when, in fact, women of color have been involved with all the different aspects of U.S. feminism. The contributions, theories, and activism of women of color are rarely mentioned in the way that the history of U.S. feminism is told. In fact, many black women and other women of color felt that despite their contributions, movements to win civil rights often did not consider gender, and organizations that fought sexism did not consider race. I started doing feminist work in like 1972, 73, but it wasn't until 1985 that I actually mm. when chose <laughs> the word feminist for myself. Because I used to say, I'm not a feminist, but, you know, mm -hmm. we used to have a whole classic, movement. Yeah. I'm not a feminist, but this is wrong. You know, <laughs> violence against black women in the black community mm -hmm. is wrong. But I'm not a feminist, but I think this is wrong <laughs> kind of thing. And that was my mantra for so many years. But when I took the job at now, the question was called. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people thought that I had sold out my black credentials mm -hmm. by taking the job at now. And I had actually women leave other organizations that I'd been a part of wow. that were women of color organizations or black organizations because they thought I'd sold out to the white women. What you are is you're informed. Your actions are informed by everything that you are. It's not by one thing mm -hmm. as opposed to the other. We conducted 10 interviews with activists who work at the intersections between the feminist movement and other forms of oppression such as race, sexual orientation, social class, and disability. Their activism and scholarship help us to understand how the idea of intersectionality can be used to organize diverse groups for social change. What black feminism does or what radical feminism does is to say things that seem like they're just quote unquote sexuality issues have huge you know, has, have a huge impact on how people get to live their lives, right? How we think about questions of sexuality and women engaged in kind of uh, the enterprise of sexual, ex you know, exchange of sex for money, if we don't begin to understand those as both class and sex and usually gender and race issues, then I think we really miss the analysis and trying to intervene in a kind of effective way to kind of transform the life conditions of those women. So, you know, I guess, I guess my plea is that we, again, kind of go back to intersectionality and really struggle with where are these intersections? Because it's, it's not only just for kind of analysis and scholarship, 
but kind of the moment of intersection is really the moment of building a broader movement, at least to me, right? If you can find those places where people may not agree in terms of racial identification or sexual identification, but where they in fact suffer um, from state regulation or some quote unquote system of oppression where they share that experience, it seems to me if we can find those spaces, those are also the spaces for shared mobilization. These activists use their experiences as members of two or more subordinated groups to think in new ways about how different kinds of discrimination intersect and support each other. If you put women of color in the center of analysis, you start to see how sexism is a tool of racism and colonialism, mm -hmm. and vice versa, so that the two need to be addressed simultaneously. And so as I became more involved, it became clear to me that there's a class component to all of these fights that are going on. What we tried to do was figure out whether women with disabilities had been discriminated against in ways that resembled or differed from other women's <coughs> discrimination or than other men with disabilities. And what we found in our work was that uh, women with disabilities were in some ways doubly uh, discriminated against. They didn't have, as, as Michelle Fine wonderfully described, the pedestal of other women. Um, mm -hmm. And they did have all the discrimination that women had. I think we have a pol uh, uh, political agenda quite often in black communities and communities of color and even in feminist politics that's usually defined by the experiences of those with greater resources. You cannot have gender liberation uh, when you have, when you continue to have class oppression, when you can, uh, when you have racial oppression, when you have sexual oppression, when you have all these systems of domination that exist. Some activists use their experiences as members of multiple groups that face discrimination to rethink what categories like race and gender mean. I'm always concerned with the question of identity and who belongs and who doesn't belong mm -hmm. and who is a member and who isn't a member and what is that membership based on. Um, just because someone shared a racial identity with us didn't mean that they also shared a political identity mm -hmm. with us. Who are the members? Are the members Palestinians or Palestinian identified? And what is Palestinian identified? Hmm. What's Palestinian? Is Palestinian a Palestin a, a woman of Palestinian parents? Half? one parent Palestinian or not, married to a Palestinian. Mm. What do we do with the women who have Palestinian women partners? I guess I don't believe in getting stuck mm -hmm. in any one identity. It's so easy to become fragmented because we live in a fragmented, fragmenting society. Activists working at the intersections between feminism and other social movements challenge U.S. feminism to rethink some familiar issues. For example, both these activists problematize the idea of reproductive rights. Reproductive oppression is economic violence. It's, mm -hmm. you know, immigration raids. It's violence against women. It's removal of children from foster, into foster care. It's all of those things. Yeah. The lack of affordable housing. The lack of child care. All of these mm -hmm. things form that, that quilt called reproductive oppression. And the only way to address reproductive oppression is through organizing people to protect their human rights mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. full panoply of human rights, not just gender rights or sexual yeah. rights, but the full, the right to have a job paying a living wage or the right to receive services in a language other than English. I mean, all of these are human rights. For the same reason that I think women and feminism critique the notion that women in Western countries or other countries choose to abort female fetuses. For, for the same reason that feminism is skeptical of that act, it may tolerate it, but it is skeptical of it. I think feminism should be skeptical of the act of aborting fetuses because of particular characteristics, whether they're sex or down syndrome, I think abortion has to be available to women as long as women are the pregnant people who bear children. Uh, if they don't want to be going through gestation, they shouldn't have to. But 
uh, I think they should think about, well, if they did want to be pregnant, why don't they want to be pregnant with a fetus that has this particular characteristic? Isn't that a kind of discrimination um, and stereotyping that they don't like in their own lives? I got into feminist work through my body. I mean, mm -hmm. it was not mm -hmm. an intellectual thing for me. Um, I didn't, there were no women's studies courses at yes, the time yeah. or anything like that. There were people who were pissed off about what had happened mm -hmm. to us and we were kind of committed to it not happening to others. I mean, I'd already had the child sexual abuse, the sterilization abuse, and I didn't necessarily see myself as anybody's victim. Mm -hmm. I saw myself as a woman who was pissed off and was pretty much going to fight to make sure that what happened to me didn't happen to other women. I had known from very early that I was not going to live that way. I was not going to do the equivalent of sitting on my husband's lap and tucking him under the, uh, the chin to get something for myself. Uh, that was not my life. I, since I could talk, I was a feminist. I mean, I just, that's, I've always been a feminist, and I'm more so now because I get so annoyed with how feminism gets defined in these very white terms. Uh -huh. and, I've, and I feel that women of color should claim the term and define it and not assume kind of the usual white history of feminism. I had the job of going around to all these women of color organizations and talk about abortion rights. And a couple of them kept asking me, well, are you a feminist? And at that point, I'm not a feminist, but wasn't making sense anymore. Mm. How can I organize women to participate in a movement I'm afraid of claiming? You know, for me, you have to fight the baggage. You have to, if you're going to get the benefits, then you have the responsibility of fighting the baggage. So to the degree that uh, we're women, and, and, and sometimes we feminine women, you know, we wear little cute stuff every now and then. But that is not the focus. The focus pr primarily is to talk about the international relief of this question of poverty. We can't do that if we section off a part of the group. I personally don't use the word feminist to describe my work or myself. That doesn't, that, that, that's not me, and I don't relate to that history. Yeah, I, I'm not a feminist. <laughs> you know. For me, like, all this work, I don't, really name it nothing, you know? It's just like, it's just what I have to do. If I were to characterize myself as something particular, I would say, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> On one hand, you want to talk about women's liberation, you want to talk about women's um, uh, feminism and so on. At the same time, you know that if, if you are part of an oppressed community, it's not only women who are oppressed. Hopefully, feminism is also in transformation. Maybe not, but I hope it is. Um, and it means that if you take into account other factors or the intersection of race, then you have to kind of really think through um, a position on, not a position on patriarchy, but the ways and the contours the nuances of patriarchy. I had a lot of disputes with um, feminist and lesbian gay critics um, and saw my artwork as kind of a response to feminist and gay theory as it was being lived out at that time. I try to think of all these various movements not so much as isms, but as ways by which each section of our society that has been denied their humanity is emerging to contribute their special strengths to the creation of a new society. Disability is still not a category that is comfortable for lots of people within feminism or anywhere else to think about. Um, as a political category, um, it's all in the sort of category of misfortune rather than uh, politics. So we're much more comfortable now than we were even when the feminist movement got started with sexual orientation 
but that same comfort of thinking about, again, disability as something that affects, say, 15% of the population, a world that really took people with disabilities into account would look quite different in some ways from the world that we have. It's not one world between men and women. Feminism is a, is a narrow point of view. We're much bigger than that. We're internationalists. Not interested in men being poor either. We ain't trying to find out how to figure out how to just free women. We want to try to figure out how everybody who is struggling to eat, like eat, housing, all these kinds of issues that they all have a way out. But one of the things that has troubled me, especially since 9-11, is this extreme attack against men. Arab and Muslim men, specifically targeted. Yeah. And the need to actually articulate a gender analysis that addresses this uh, victimization and targeting of Arab and Muslim men. And at the same time, also acknowledges, recognizes, and theorizes, and comes up with agendas for uh, women's liberation. But I do believe that the sort of hierarchical, patriarchal way in which we're doing things has created such a mess mm -hmm. that people to whom the more natural, informal ways of organizing around kitchen, story, kitchen tables or telling stories and things like that, that that's a, a much more natural way of organizing as we move into trying to create something new. We formed the, uh, the uh, National Welfare Rights Union and we wanted it to be a union because uh, it could not be just people on public assistance like in the past. It had to be a, a unified type of thing between the employed, unemployed, organized, unorganized, folks that were facing the type of problems that poor people face no, and no. we had to solidify. We had to make sure that we fought for unity there and this union was that type of thing that we wanted to form. I think it's a lot of problems why particularly women of color get into trouble is that they think they have to do this narrow individualistic approach mm -hmm. and they don't have a collective base to protect them to deal with the racism in the institution. You must have a commitment to community and you must kind of work to kind of transform people's lives including your own life. So therefore we are trying to put all together one integral, integral work, map, action plan, whatever you want to call. As I told you, it's easy. Someone's work having experience from the top to the bottom leaderships. Now the leadership that we want to build is a collective that we have been building. Between the audience and myself, we're not necessarily all in agreement, but we're inspiring, challenging each other, um, and reminding ourselves that just because our worldview is not part of commercial culture doesn't mean that our critique's not valid. Part of what it means to be a scholar activist is not only to en kind of engage political questions in your work, but to place yourself in institutions and organizations where you can be held accountable for the work that you do. In places like women's studies programs, gay and lesbian studies projects, African American studies, Latino studies, Asian American studies uh, programs and departments have become more and more detached from actually the everyday lives of the people that we supposedly represent in those institutions. Well, if you're going to go in academia and you consider yourself an activist, you shouldn't drop activism. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just suicide, not just in terms of any global oppression, but even being academically successful. We thought that the academic relationship was beyond the university, beyond the school, that it should be one, an interaction between the field, the university, the research, how your potential res research can be helping not just to the academic label or other people, also how it can be uh, used for the workers. Every generation has the right to define the struggle on their own mm -hmm. terms. And it's not our right to look back or forward mm -hmm. to tell people what they should or should not be doing. If you are doing your job, you're trying to figure out 
how to best play the hand you've been dealt. Mm -hmm. And if you preoccupy yourself with that, the rest will take care of itself. Each of us can choose to do something different because we recognize that for our own humanity, we have to. When I been going through all this process in my life, I been learning so much. I'm thinking my fellow workers every day because they were teaching me so much. They were giving me strength. Marta is no Marta. Marta is million of workers in the maquilas and million of women in the war. And just together, we can change this system and make a better world for us. I am not defined by my oppressions and nobody should be.